Episode 10. Is the BBC too close to Stonewall? Stephen, the fact is that the Chief Constable has lost the confidence of the people of Northern Ireland all round the Bobby Story funeral. On the Nolan Radio Show, it's no holds barred. Hard questions. Uh, here, obviously it will, but here, which here, decision? Here, here, here. You're criticising the police for having taken the decision. Steve Aiken is the leader of the Austrian Unionist Party, and he's on air and he's not able to answer a simple question. Here's Stephen, we don't want to see any of that happening. That's not my question. Not- and just in case you think we're being tough in this podcast, well, at the end of the day, it's what we do. We're in a public health situation here, and the Chief Constable is partly responsible to make sure that that public health message is enforced. We recently interviewed a political leader, and within weeks, he was gone. Stephen, that will be the role. Stephen, what we need. Stephen, Stephen. Do you think after this interview today, you should consider your position? Absolutely not. I'm the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party. I'm here to lead the Ulster Unionist Party through. That's what we need to do. Steve Aiken, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, sir. Steve Aiken, in his letter today, confirmed that his two year term as leader of the Ulster Unionist Party is coming to an end. He said he felt it. We're scrutinising the BBC just as we would any politician or anyone else. I've spoken to a number of journalists within the BBC who are really uncomfortable about this relationship with Stonewall but don't think that they can talk. But now we have someone to talk. She's just left the BBC, but she's willing to speak now. Sam Smith, a BBC journalist, thinks that people are frightened to speak out, to say what they really think about Stonewall, given the pressure that comes with doing that on social media and beyond. Hi. So, Sam, you worked for the BBC for many years in Inside Out. You were an investigative journalist there. That's right, yeah, I did 25 years in the BBC. I started at Five Live working as a journalist and latterly as the editor of the Southwest edition of Inside Out, which was the kind of regional current affairs program. It was an absolute joy to be working for an organisation where you just felt completely aligned to its core principles. And one of those core principles was impartiality, independence, right? And before I was an editor, I was a presenter. As a presenter, you get asked quite a lot to, you know, open things or lend your support to charities and so on and you know with just one or two fates that I opened I said no to everything you know I was absolutely clear on it that this is what the organization expected of me personally not to align myself to any cause or political position however noble however kind however well-meaning it seemed to be and this is the difficulty I have with the BBC lining itself up with Stonewall in the way it has, being part of the Stonewall Club, being marked by Stonewall. Paying uh, money and, for Stonewall. And paying money for Stonewall and using Stonewall's language. It, I, how is that independent? How is that impartial? And, and um, it must have a chilling effect on many of our editorial staff who, for example, are faced with covering the legal cases that are going on at the moment around Stonewall being in many other of our state institutions and organisations. So how can it not have a chilling effect when it's writ large across the BBC that we are a champion? I can't think of anything else the BBC's done that's in the same ballpark. Um, We take advice from the Samaritans, don't we, about our language around suicide. They're kind of our sole advisors, if you like, as the experts on media coverage of this issue and I think for a lot of staff they're actually just trying to be nice and they see our relationship with Stonewall as part of being nice to people who might you know face discrimination and so on the the trouble is the impartiality element of this for people who do not agree with Stonewall's campaigning position on the gender identity issue Okay, it is not nice for an organisation to align itself with Stonewall and Stonewall's mission. That is not nice to people who are on the other side of this debate. We have to be impartial about niceness. And I honestly think a lot of this is just a lot of, you know, decent people thinking they're doing the right thing by embracing diversity, being kind. They think they're on the right side of history. Come on, you know, Sam. All those Come on. You're giving them a Bible. Come on. They're journalists, for goodness sake. Their whole job is to be curious and scrutinise and not take as a matter of fact what someone says to them. So I, I, I like you, I love this organisation. 
It is my dream to work in the BBC. And I mean that. I think it's an incredible organisation. But I want to know how the BBC has got itself in a position where it is taking its lead, not from itself, but from a lobbying group. One of the big unanswered questions so far in this podcast is, has Stonewall had an influence over the BBC's editorial? The BBC have refused to give us the correspondence they've had with Stonewall, so we can't say 100%. But we do know that in an article to BBC staff discussing the relationship with Stonewall, the BBC said that some of the things that had helped them move up Stonewall's equality index was that they had appointed the first ever LGBTQ plus news correspondent and first gender and identity correspondent in BBC News. We've corporately adopted the term LGBTQ plus, Stonewall's term, and that we've been raising awareness of the importance of gender pronouns. Now, they're all issues that Stonewall have lobbied on and the BBC has moved on. So that is prima facie evidence of Stonewall having some success influencing the BBC's editorial. And I know some journalists in the BBC saw it exactly that way. So hopefully we'll get some straight answers from the BBC on that. Since we started working on this podcast, the BBC's former LGBT correspondent, Ben Hunt, has left the corporation for a role in Vice World News. Here he is when he was working for the BBC. The BBC's LGBT correspondent, Ben Hunt. I've come to one of the UK's only club nights dedicated to black and Asian LGBT people. And I'm here to hear all about their dating experiences. Right, so there's been a lot of criticism from the gender critical people, Stonewall's opponents, basically about this video. It's a Stonewall video about the Stonewall riots in America commemorating the anniversary. I don't know what the Stonewall riots were. Well, the Stonewall riots were essentially uh, what a lot of people look back on now as the point where the gay rights movement began, where people stood up against the state and the oppression of the state and fought fought for their freedom. Um, And that's where the Stonewall charity's name comes from. So... Stonewall have done a little video to commemorate one of a series of videos for LGBTQ History Month and it's presented by Ben Hunt, our BBC correspondent. BBC LGBT correspondent? Yeah, BBC LGBT correspondent Ben Hunt, yeah. On June 28th, 1969, police raided the Stonewall Inn and people fought back in a spontaneous, violent uprising that ended up in the streets outside. They'd had enough. The uprising turned into days of protests and activist groups started to spring up. Together, those groups were known as the Gay Liberation Front. Copycat groups started worldwide, including the UK Gay Liberation Front, and the fight for equality went global. Gender critical people are angry about this video because, and and people who oppose Stonewall for many different reasons, because there's a BBC correspondent front, and I think it was a TikTok video originally, this is posted on Twitter, um, for a a campaign organisation which they fundamentally disagree with on lots of issues. I can't think of another example where a BBC correspondent would front a video for a campaign group. Ben Hunt has fronted an initiative for Stonewall. How is that consistent with any BBC role? Well, I mean, how does that give the impression of impartiality? Well, maybe the maybe the argument is there's nothing he's saying there that which is contentious. Nothing that I'm aware of that's contentious. That you know he's appearing in this video and he's talking about history. No, but no, but the you know I you know there's nothing contentious about Bernardo's. There's nothing contentious about, you know, other charities, but I can't go and front something for them because the valid question would be why am I not fronting something for every other charity? So if Ben Hunt is fronting a video for Stonewall, the next question is why is he not fronting videos for the opponents of Stonewall within the LGB movement, right? Yeah, and there's an issue here about the perception of impartiality because it's not just about impartiality, it's about the public's perceptions. And in such a toxic debate, Ben, in his B- he's not saying he's in this BBC role, but he is a BBC LGBT correspondent, and he's fronting a video for Stonewall. And and people are you sure to that he's fronting a video for Stonewall? One hundred percent. We asked the BBC to explain why the then BBC's Ben Hunt was fronting Stonewall's videos. We asked the BBC to explain to us how Stonewall's position of having multiple genders in society had suddenly become the language of the BBC's education department. They did not answer the specific questions. They did not provide anybody for interview 
on their own network. Here's the BBC statement. As a broadcaster, we have our own values and editorial standards. These are clearly set out and published in our editorial guidelines. We are also governed by the Royal Charter and the Ofcom Broadcasting Code. In Ben's defence, the BBC already has a relationship with them. So why wouldn't he? The BBC pays this organisation money for advice, and that advice filters down through the organisation, as we well know. So what's the difference between that and Ben presenting a TikTok video for them? Why is there a difference between this one lobby group and all of the others out there on a range of issues? Why is this the one that's inside the BBC advising us on HR policy and we're paying money to? We don't pay money to any of the other lobby groups. This is what a senior figure in the BBC's Diversity and Inclusion Department told staff in response to the BBC Newsnight programme's coverage of trans issues. Not necessarily my view, but certainly the BBC's view is that we always need to be presenting a balanced argument and a balanced debate, and and that's why both sides' arguments are shared. Hopefully that kind of thing might change over time and things become less of a debate and more of a kind of right. The BBC will always say that there's a separation between the BBC as a broadcaster and its internal HR and the diversity and inclusion people. But when you have a BBC manager essentially being critical of how BBC journalists handle this debate and how they cover it and saying that we need to get beyond that into a position of rights, who is he speaking on behalf of? Is he speaking on behalf of this organisation? And if you are a journalist here and you're looking to a manager making his position very clear about the rights and wrongs of open debate around this issue, that's bound to have a chilling effect throughout the organisation. Here's Benjamin Cohen, CEO of Pink News. Straight question, straight answer. Would you support the BBC signing up to an equality index created and marked by the LGB Alliance? Um, I... I wouldn't because I don't believe that the LGB Alliance are... Well, firstly, they're not doing one. And it, I would have... But to, if they chose to do one... I wouldn't support anyone, whether it's the BBC or anyone else, signing up to an equality index. This is run by an organisation with unclear policies around their approach to equality. But, defining... but what the BBC have done and what all of these other public institutions have done, essentially, is, is state that Stonewall are the accepted experts in all of this. Who's given them that title? I just don't agree with the thesis, and that's the problem. So I don't believe that's what the BBC... If the BBC... I don't know the details about whether the BBC has or hasn't done particular things, but um, I would say that if the BBC's uh, people team, we used to be called things like human resources, have decided that they wish to engage with services, um, I... I think that's a matter for internal BBC. Yeah, the BBC have described Stonewall Benjamin as the experts. Um, well, I would say that they are... I w- I, so I wouldn't say the experts. I would say they are experts, though. So I wouldn't use... I wouldn't... So if you want me to criticise your employer, I would say I wouldn't have put the word there because there's not a single um, expert... There's not a sole expert on this topic. Are LGB, are LGB Alliance experts? Uh, are they entitled to the same impartiality and impartial analysis? You couldn't ask the LGB Alliance to take a position on, uh, for example, to ask them to to judge the BBC's uh, policies relating to non-binary people or to trans people because they specifically claim to represent lesbian, gay and bisexual people. That is the clue that's in their title. And and it was a legitimate criticism that I had of the Workplace Equality Index previously was that Stonewall was judging it, judging things, but at that point they were only advocating and representative of lesbian, gay and bisexual people as opposed to also trans and non-binary people, which it now advocates now. We contacted LGB Alliance about the claims made by Benjamin Cohen. In a statement they said... Given that we've been a charity for a matter of months, have no staff and rely entirely on volunteers, it's not terribly surprising we don't have policies on every issue. The first ever LGBTQ plus news correspondent and first gender and identity correspondent in BBC News. 
we've corporately adopted the term LGBTQ+, Stonewall's term, and that we've been raising awareness of the importance of gender pronouns. Now, they're all issues that Stonewall have lobbied on and the BBC has moved on. So that is prima facie evidence of Stonewall having some success influencing the BBC's editorial. And I know some journalists in the BBC saw it exactly that way. Ex-BBC investigative journalist Sam Smith. I don't... I just don't see how an organisation can split itself in two like that and say, on our corporate HR side, we have one set of values and one set of relationships and, and we can kind of, uh, you know, get into bed with certain political campaigning organisations and that's fine. And we can put this sort of wall up, right, and our staff will understand that, that what we say to them as staff, we don't want them to say to the audience. We don't want them to adopt those values and positions that we adopt on the corporate side of our organisation. I don't see how... The BBC can have this relationship and Tim Davey can still get up and talk about impartiality. You can't you can't sever off one bit of the organisation and say, well, that bit we don't actually have to we can align ourselves to this, you know, organization with a very strong political position. Sam, have we got the most powerful broadcasting organization in the UK too close to one of the most powerful lobbying groups in the UK? I don't think it should have any relationship, never mind the extremely... You know, to to have our HR department checking with Stonewall over our recruitment language, okay? Language is crucial. Language is so important. For me, in, you know, my career, I can't think of anything else I've covered where words, syllables... Language has been so crucial to maintaining impartiality. You know, you can't, you can't slip up here. And yet the BBC has allowed it, this language into its corporate side and it's, and it's there in its editorial as well. Benjamin Cohen again from Pink News. Yeah, I mean, we don't use, as it happens, our current uh, style guide is not to use LGBTQ+. We use LGBT+. So why has the BBC decided to use it? Well, as it happens, we're having an internal debate at the moment about whether we adopt LGBTQ+, because that's the term that's used by uh, younger people. Um, So we are considering changing our own guidelines. We used to use, uh, we used to as well, like Stonewall, Right at the beginning, not be not wasn't like intentionally non-trans inclusive, but we would describe ourselves as LGB news, and then it became LGBT coverage, and then it became LGBT plus. Every license fee payer throughout the United Kingdom is unable to know whether Stonewall have actually influenced the BBC to use that term. My honest view is that I doubt it because the advice that Stone was giving the BBC, as far as I'm aware, is, is relating to the treatment of you and your colleagues as employees rather than uh, in the methodology that you're broadcasting. I would accept that if the BBC's changed the terminology, that there may be an influence, but it might not just be from Stonewall. It's just the fact that the BBC is a multinational broadcaster and produces content for a variety of audiences and this is the thing that we're facing at Pink News, most of our audiences in America and the terminology that is used by most news organisations in America now is LGBTQ+, and so that's one of the reasons that we're considering changing our style guide and the BBC uh, with the many tens of thousands of people who work at the BBC may be somewhat advanced in us in in working on a style guide. Well another question I wondered, because the BBC told staff that they were keen to move up the Workplace Equality Index and they set that as a goal and they they listed some examples of things that they have done which have improved LGBTQ equality as part of that and one of those things was the use of promoting gender pronouns for staff which obviously is controversial with some people. Why is it controversial but anyway I'll I'll let you carry on with your question. Well you know the debate as well as I do Benjamin but the... Help me here between the two of you what is... Why is it controversial, David? David can explain why it's controversial, and I can tell you why I don't think it is, which is <laughs> fine. Well, well, looking at this, there are two sides to this debate, aren't there? It's about sex versus gender, essentially, and gender identity. So a lot of people who argue sex is more important than your gender identity will argue that if you start to bring in pronouns into organisations, you're essentially taking a political position on the side of gender identity. Well, that's what those people argue. Yeah, I understand. And look, I'm, I'm not disputing that some people find it uncomfortable, but I'll give you my perspective 
as I said, I'm an employer, so I'll give you my perspective as an employer. So we do have a pronouns policy on our email signatures and on Slack, which we use for internal messaging. Our pronouns are declared. And when we do a meeting with someone external or when there's a candidate coming for a, to you know, be interviewed for a job, I'd say, hi, my name's Benjamin. My pronouns are he, him. And that's really important. And I'll explain why. We have a number of trans colleagues in the team. We have a number of non-binary colleagues in the team. And knowing that someone's preferred pronoun is they, them, or that their pronoun is he, if they're a trans man, for example, is really important so that that employee doesn't get misgendered. And, and it's to avoid awkward like, situations where someone might inadvertently misgender someone. So I understand why some people don't like this, but this really is for the benefit of a particular group but also for everyone to just make the workplace a less awkward place. Because I can certainly tell you that as an employer, it would be absolutely mortifying and embarrassing if I misgendered an employee. You know, I'm the CEO, and obviously it's not the same as being the Director General of the BBC, but the CEO of a company has like a degree of authority and is, in inverted commas, a scary person. If I misgendered a really junior member of the team they would probably find that quite distressing and they might find it awkward to tell me that I am misgendering them, but I have no... It may, it's very difficult for me to misgender them because I can see their pronouns on the system and the first time that we would have met, we would have shared what, what our preferred pronouns are. And so that's why I'm saying I don't consider it to be particularly contentious, if an individual... But Benjamin, as an employer, if you had a, a member of staff who held gender-critical views and they didn't want to take part in that and they didn't want to put their pronouns on those emails, should that be compulsory? Would you make an employee do that? I would say that it's unlikely that someone with gender-critical views would either apply for or be successful in being employed at... You couldn't discriminate on someone based on gender-critical views. I can't discriminate against them based on... Well, the 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 recent thing would say that it's a protected characteristic as a belief, right? Um, I think it would be incredibly unlikely that someone who holds views that are contrary to the stated mission and values of Pink News would wish to work at Pink News. Yeah, but let's take this outside of Pink News and let's look at, you know, government institutions. Should an employee be compelled to write that it's he, she, they, them? Uh, Honest answer is, I think there's a very specific thing at an organisation like Pink News, but I think that at a public sector body, of which the BBC is one, I think that it should be probably described as good practice. Why? Stephen, would you not want to know whether someone you're working with, uh, whether you might be inadvertently offending or upsetting someone that you're working with? But if you're in a working environment and you have a good relationship with your colleagues and, and there's a good working environment... Well, why, how would you have a good, how would you have a good working, how would me and you have a good, I, I, can I ask you, what's your preferred pronoun, David? I, I don't have a preferred pronoun. How would people normally refer to you? Would they say, he said, they said, she said? There's presumably one of those three which people would say to you. They would say he, they would say he. If someone consistently said to you, when describing you, used she, would you find that, you wouldn't find that distressing if, for example, the Director General... But I think I think what you're talking about here is when someone discovers someone has, has preferred pronouns, they continue to misgender them. Yeah, but I mean, I'm saying... You're suggesting everyone puts this on a system or on their email address, which I think is a step further. If the Director General of the BBC came on a visit to Northern Ireland and came to the radio studio and throughout the conversation misgendered you... Would you find that awkward at all? Or you're saying you wouldn't find that awkward if they referred to you as a woman, for example, and using the she pronouns? You might find that awkward. So that's the reason why the Director General knowing, the Director General knowing what your preferred pronoun is, is a good idea. Well, if the Director General called me a woman, I would say, actually, I'm a man. Yeah, but you wouldn't find that at all an awkward conversation to be having. Not really, no. But I'm saying that, would that be an awkward conversation if you were transgender do you think i don't know and it's not for me to speak on behalf of transgender people i imagine it would be i imagine it would be difficult so therefore why not have a system in place that and as i said best practice i said i'm not 
I don't think that it should be, you know, you'd be fired if you don't do it, but to consider it's a best practice, why would that be a bad thing? Because someone can opt out if they don't want to be part of it. Just while we're on this point, Benjamin, Pink News described Deborah Cohen, a BBC journalist, as a white cisgender woman when it was writing a critical piece on a piece that she'd done. Why? Uh, I don't know the specific piece. What's the relevance of Deborah Cohen's race or... So, As I said, so, I, I don't know the piece, so I can't tell you about the piece. So, okay, so that, that, that's fair enough that you don't know about the specific piece. I totally accept that. But if a, you know, a journalist or anybody else for that matter, if their skin colour and their race are being put into an article, do you think that's a mistake? I mean, think that's a mistake. have you read the number of stories that are in the press about me that specifically refer to me being Jewish? Um, and when I post things on... Two wrongs wouldn't make a right. No, I, no, I'm not saying so. I'm just... All I'm saying is that yeah, it's, not, sure. it's not... It's quite common. So I can't say that one is right or wrong. Sometimes it's actually relevant for the story. So why... Well, well the so story was it, about detransitioners. So is it is it her race relevant in an article well, about By the way, this isn't a this isn't an attack on you. I'm trying to understand... It's a reasonable do question. You, do, do, do I, you I, think I, it's what relevant? What I would say is, I don't know because I haven't seen the story, but if I can't... And if I have, I can't remember okay. it. Okay, when would it ever be relevant what the race of a journalist is when they're covering a story. Well, I would say if the story doesn't relate to race, I'm not sure it is relevant. So and I'm not saying like you've caught me out. I don't know as I don't know the context of the story and I don't know why that might have been put in the story. But And what am I? Am I a white sorry, this is a genuine question. Am I a white cis male? Is that what I am? Yeah, I well I was gonna say I believe you are, but we've never actually okay. met in real life. So like is it relevant in this interview that I'm a white cis male? It could be, because Why? we're talking about issues relating to diversity, but I will ex- I'm will. i not going to debate you about whether a particular story, I don't know when it was written, was... No, and I accept that. Was, I accept that. Stonewall have had a big influence in the public debate, or lack of it, on sex and gender identity issues. Sam Smith, a former BBC journalist says she felt that the language used by Stonewall was filtering through to editorial output. The Style Guide advised journalists that they should refer to people as the sex of their choice. Okay, so if a man says he's a woman, you refer to that person as a woman. In all circumstances, there don't seem to be any exceptions to that. So that's essentially self-identification? Yeah, it's self-ID. And, I mean, you have to understand, you know, as a current affairs journalist in the regions, this wasn't one of my targets to sort this out, you know? My boss hadn't asked me to kind of deal with all this stuff, but I did feel a wider responsibility to try and find out what was going on. And looking at the BBC's output, talking to some colleagues, working in London, where I think this is a particularly acute issue for staff working in London, I think there was significant evidence that the BBC's language, both on the HR corporate side, if you like, and certainly on that side, had been adjusted, had been changed. Words were being used that, to me, are not words that most people understand. OK, so if you apply for a job in the BBC and you start to fill out the recruitment form, the form asks you whether your sex is the, or your gender, is now, is the same as the gender or sex, I can't remember which, that you were assigned at birth, okay? Now, believe me, when you have a baby, no one phones you up and asks you, oh, uh, congratulations, what sex was it assigned at birth? Okay, this is not normal language. This is not common parlance. This is, this is political language. This is campaigning language. And it's the campaigning language which is used by organisations who are on one particular side of that political campaign, the most prominent of which is Stonewall. And when I queried this, because I did start to query some of this stuff, I was told that uh, the BBC had kind of checked this with, with Stonewall and Stonewall were fine. They were fine with it and therefore the BBC was fine with it. How has the BBC got itself into a position where rather than making decisions for itself, it is taking what Stonewall tell it? I thought all these managers in this organisation were in this organisation to take decisions on behalf of licence fee payers, not to defer them to a lobby group outside of the BBC who have one particular agenda, their agenda. If an organisation starts to adopt the language, I mean, you know, particularly, clearly a media organisation, starts to adopt the language of a political campaigning position, 
And it is in our editorial as well. It isn't, so you see the word cis, for example. Cis is a word used by, again, you know, one side of this particular political campaign to put, make women sort of a subset, biological women, a subset of w- woman as, as, a, as an identity, okay? And people on the other side of this argument really object to that. They find that word cis incredibly offensive. Does the BBC now use the term cis? Uh, I've seen it in our editorial. Yeah, I've seen it on our website. I've seen it on our website. Are we using it because Stonewall have told us to? You know, well, maybe we could find out if the BBC would answer our <laughs> freedom of information. I mean, this is presumably what we're going to get with this stuff, is exactly what the advice was from Stonewall. Were they saying, in editorial output, you should no longer use these terms and you should use these terms? And there has been a shift in BBC language. For example, if you see in BBC copy now, it says LGBTQ+ which is something that is quite new. That's now, whether they asked for it or whether it's bled through, but that's now been used in, in editorial output by the BBC. When, when a manager in here puts it in black and white, Stonewall are the experts, then how can the BBC say it, its relationship with Stonewall does not affect the editorial? Because the BBC has said out loud, Stonewall are the experts, therefore most journalists in the BBC are going to be less likely to challenge what Stonewall are saying because management are saying they're the experts. They know what they're doing. Well, guess what? Here's what the Nolan Show is saying. We are going to be as curious and test Stonewall as we would any other body. So we're not accepting they're the experts. We are questioning everything they do. And we're questioning this very close relationship that the BBC has with Stonewall. Yeah, and I think it comes back to something I think, David, you said, which is it's a journalist's job to to question everything. And if someone claims to be an expert on something, well, you know, you've got to test that. You've got to see the evidence. And like you, I would expect every journalist in the BBC to be questioning all of this every day and every opportunity. Well, it must be but frightening, though. Think... It must be frightening. Yeah, exactly. if, you've, if you've got the exactly. BBC in a relationship yeah. with Stonewall... It must be frightening for a lot of journalists to, to try to get in the middle of that. I do hope that, that somebody very senior in the BBC stands up and addresses this whole issue really head on and really directly because I just think qu- quite a lot of people, even seasoned journalists, won't understand that when Tim Davy talks about impartiality and independence, that includes this area as well. This is not exempt. This is not... We've already decided that this is right side of history, you know, to accept a man who says he's a woman actually is a woman, right? That's not been decided. It's not been decided in law. There hasn't been a big public debate about it. And so the BBC shouldn't have already settled on that. And I think a lot of people in the BBC think it has been settled and it hasn't been settled. The BBC acts independently in all our aspects of our operations, from HR policy to editorial guidelines and content. We aim to be industry-leading on workforce inclusion and take advice from a range of external organisations. However, we make the final decision on any BBC policies or practices ourselves. We are not a member of Stonewall, we do not take legal advice from Stonewall and we do not subscribe to Stonewall's campaigning. The charity simply provides advice that we are able to consider. As a broadcaster, we have our own values and editorial standards. These are clearly set out and published in our editorial guidelines. We are also governed by the Royal Charter and the Ofcom Broadcasting Code. What are the different gender identities? That's a really, really exciting question to ask. Do you know there are so many gender identities? So we know we've got male and female, but there are over 100, if not more, gender identities now. We asked the BBC specific questions about this educational video. They failed to answer any of our questions in their statement. We are aware of a statement that they've issued previously in which they said the Big Talk film was only available on the BBC Teach website where they pointed out that that was for teachers to use for curriculum support and they said it was never aimed directly at pupils and was never intended to be used independently by them at any age nor did it form part of our current lockdown learning offer, they had said at the time. But of course, children were featured in that video. Children were being told in that video. 
So that video must have been at least relatable to children and teachers might very well have shown it to children. The BBC had said in their previous statement the content was clearly labelled as requiring advanced viewing by teachers, but it came with the BBC brand on it. This was a BBC educational tool. And they had said previously, and why did they not put this in their current statement? But they had said previously that they were aware in their view that the particular film was being willfully misrepresented by parts of the media and others on social media. And they said they had withdrawn it. They didn't use the word withdrawn. They'd actually said in a previous statement they had made the decision to, quote, retire the film. I despair when I'm sitting in here on a Friday afternoon and I really want to go home. A Friday afternoon, might I add, when I have five live tonight and your man's going back to scratch himself for three days. And here you are with a wee wad of paper. Make this quick. Right, so uh, the BBC Style Guide is... Oh, Thompson, who cares about the BBC Style Guide on a Friday afternoon, seriously? Well, this is what, this gets to the heart of all of what we've been doing. Has Stonewall's influence affected BBC's editorial? We've heard in this podcast about how the Diversity and Inclusion Unit are influenced by Stonewall and would use Stonewall's resources and use Stonewall language when they're talking to staff. Now, our understanding is that when the BBC Style Guide was being updated, Diversity and Inclusion had an input. Diversity and Inclusion? Yes. So diversity and inclusion, which are supposed to be, the whole message has always been, it's an internal matter, it's about HR, all of this, but diversity and inclusion had an input into the BBC Style Guide, the language we use. But the language, look, I, I've been in this organisation a long time, and you're telling me... Diversity and inclusion have had a major input into this. So Into how we speak? In, into the language we use, and it's particularly on this issue of around sex and gender and sexuality and all of these different terms. So there's a piece in The Spectator, and it's, it's entitled The BBC's Woke Guide to Gender, and they're very critical of some of the way the BBC defines some of these terms. And the key one is around the definition of homosexual. So, so the, the BBC has in its official paperwork how it defines homosexual? Yes, so we've got that. So we've got the new style guide. There's been a lot of fuss over this, and it was, it's been me mentioned for a long time. It's now come out, and the BBC say homosexual means people of either sex who are attracted to people of their own gender, but take care how you use it. Now, people may of think... Of their own gender? Yeah. Most people who listen to that might not notice that, but that's very significant in this whole debate, attracted to people of their own gender, because a lot of gay people will say it's not about gender at all, it's about sex. They're same-sex attracted. What the spectator piece is arguing is that it's very similar to the language that Stonewall uses. Now, the question here is, all along we've been wondering, has Stonewall had input into the BBC's output in the language that we use? And while we can't say for certain that it definitely did, we know that the... Because the BBC won't disclose any of its conversations between itself and Stonewall, right? We haven't been allowed to see that. They're not going to give us that. Um, they've made that really clear. But Thompson, don't be so kind to the BBC with that. You know, we haven't been allowed to see it. The public haven't been allowed to see it. We asked for it on behalf of the public. The BBC said, no, public, you ain't seeing it, despite the fact that you're licence fee pairs. Yeah. So they've shut the public out of seeing it. In that Allies meeting that we listened to earlier in the podcast, you'll hear the diversity and inclusion trainer in the BBC Allies scheme talking about the language guide. What wasn't said was that they actually had an input to it. Sources in the BBC told us that diversity and inclusion did have an input into it. And a lot of people were very annoyed about that. People were outraged that they would have had an input Some to people. it. Some people. Lots of people would have been outraged. Well, you don't know lots of people, do you? Well, I do, because I've spoken to lots of people who are really annoyed that diversity and inclusion people would be allowed into something so sensitive because there is a perception that diversity and inclusion's thinking on all of this stuff is too close to Stonewall's thinking. And we now know that one of the trainers from diversity and inclusion was using the gender-bred person, which in itself has a bias. And we also know that diversity and inclusion 
described Stonewall on behalf of the BBC as the experts in this area. The way the spectators sum this up is, they say, a complete coincidence, no doubt, that the BBC's language matches up with that of Stonewall. We went back to the BBC to ask them about the style guide. We asked, were Stonewall consulted by any part of the BBC about the language used in this style guide? Were Stonewall definitions used elsewhere in the BBC considered when drafting this style guide? How does the BBC explain its definitions being closer to those used by Stonewall than the dictionary definition? We also asked them about the Allies' training and about the use of the gender-bred person. What did they do? They just referred us to their previous statement. An organisation that asks many, many people every second of every day to appear on its outlets across the world couldn't find a human being to speak to its own organisation on this podcast and to you, the audience. Not one living, breathing human being could speak. All we got was a reference to the previous statement. You know, I, I, I really do hope, you know, we're sitting here on a Friday afternoon, two employees of the BBC, and this is not about us knocking the BBC because, you know, my life is this organisation and I treasure this organisation and I passionately, genuinely mean that. And I know, Thompson, you feel the same. We're sitting here on a Friday afternoon trying to do what the BBC stands for and that is to, to challenge and inquire and bring openness and transparency to the public. And if that includes needing to do it about the BBC, then I actually think that the majority of people who believe in the BBC, whether they agree with what we're doing or not, will get the principle of what we're doing. Just one thing to point out why this is important and why this language is important to us as journalists. You know how tricky it is when we're doing these debates. And we've debated the very issue of whether or not it's transphobic for a gay person to not to want to date a trans person, for example. Well, if you go by the BBC Style Guide, that's closed off, that's decided. Homosexuality, according to the BBC, is about people who are attracted to people of the same gender. So that controversial debate is now summed up in the BBC Style Guide, and they've made their position really clear. Oh, I get it now. I see you're smarter than me, so I get it now. So basically, the BBC is stating as fact, because it's changed its language, if a male, if a gay male, in the BBC's wording now, that means they're attracted not to someone with male genitalia, but to someone also who says, I'm a man, whether they have a vagina and breasts or not. Yeah, and it's obviously not just about the genitalia, a lot of people will say that, but it's about the sex of the person, the natal sex, how they were born, the entire package, if you want. So people are same-sex attracted, not according to the BBC anymore. Homosexual means people of either sex who are attracted to people of their own gender. You know, the other big question here is, who signed off on this? Because if this is affecting the language throughout the organisation, then someone very, very senior must be signing off on this. These decisions are signed off by BBC News. Now, this is an area of contention as well. Many bisexual people would say it's about being attracted to both sexes. The BBC now define bisexual an adjective to describe someone who is romantically and or sexually attracted to more than one gender. So the BBC have now redefined the definition of bisexuality? And homosexuality. So they've redefined sexuality to make it more about gender than sex, right at the heart of this whole debate. Right at the heart of this, right whole, debate. The heart of this whole debate. Tom, so are we going to get sacked to this podcast? Like, what's going to happen when we publish this thing? 
Your guess is as good as mine. You've been around longer than me, you should know. I've been around longer than you up to now. What do you think? Come on. Let's go. Yeah, let's leave that last bit out. <laughs> right, well, 